sometimes when you see the prices people want for a piece of hardware, you, you have to think there's, there's something wrong here or, or I'm just not getting it. And one good example of this is Saturn 486 motherboards, and we've got a couple such examples here today. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and we're going to have a look at those two examples and see is there really anything special about these boards that warrants the kind of prices people want. I mean, they're certainly not the steepest examples of things out there, and I didn't pay the kind of money people ask for, but hmm, I don't know. We'll have to have a look at them. Maybe they've got some hidden aces up their sleeves because they sure aren't good looking, are they? So, well, let's get on with that and I'll meet you back here at the end like usual. Oh, I've got spiders in here as well. Cool. Here's the first of our two motherboards, the Asus PVI 486AP4. Ugh, I can already hear the idiots getting angry. The Asus crowd aren't quite as dumb as the 3DFX crowd, but often do subscribe to the idea that if something doesn't work, it's just my fault for trying to use the PC for the functions it was built for, and I should instead just not do those things with it. I mean, why run software on your PC when you can just post about your overpriced hardware and how great that makes you on the internet? I sort of wonder if us ECS people aren't the same, but are just too busy actually using our computers to waste our time doing stuff like that. Oh yeah, this ECS board's so good. Yeah, I should totally go on the internet and like, tell everyone I've got it, just to show them how great I am. There better not be any people out there who like gigabyte motherboards though, because otherwise I'll have to get really, really angry with them for like indifferent stuff to me. Because I was told this was the best, and therefore they must be wrong, and I have to show them that they're wrong with some unfounded insults. That's that, I'll just have a little game on hover actually, it's probably a bit more fun. Looking at the board in person, I can't really see what it has to justify the prices people want. For a board produced in late 1994, it actually comes off as rather anemic, as it lacks a few features that were starting to become commonplace, and, well, really were by this stage. For one thing, the CPU support is limited to 3V processors only, and not that wide of a range of those. There's nothing in the way of onboard I.O. except a PS2 mouse header, which I don't really care for, and weirdly, this IDE interface. This is actually annoying, as now we need an I.O. card, but these typically have IDE on them, and often this can't be turned off. The one on the motherboard can't be turned off either, at least not without cutting traces, so you'll just have to set it to secondary and hope it doesn't get in the way of anything. The LED header is between the slots too, which is plain weird and pretty irritating. This whole thing feels like a strange sort of afterthought that's just been tacked on, and I'm not really sure why they did it. I can only really conclude then that the price must have something to do with the Intel chipset, or the fact we have PCI and VLB. Or do we? Well, nothing's ever that straightforward on a PC, and for a start, the implementation is garbage. PCI interrupts are set with this huge column of jumpers, which is never a good sign, and usually accompanies a rather flaky PCI bus that won't work with a lot of expansion cards. Also, that isn't a real VLB slot. Oh yeah, that's what you're looking at here, it's a 486 that doesn't have real VLB on board. Instead, this slot is bridged to PCI 2. It's interesting how Asus considered the front of the board to be the farthest from the case rear, which sounds sensible, but nobody really seems to be able to make up their mind on this. Though let's not get distracted yet, this is fake VLB, like you would get on those Pentium boards, uh, only I don't see a visible bridge chip, so it's not exactly looking good for this board really, is it? On top of all that, you also heard right that it shares with PCI 2. If we use PCI slot 2, we can't use the VLB slot. If we use the VLB slot, we cannot use PCI slot 2. 
but I'm hoping you spotted that this also means we can't use PCI-4 either, as they shared the same hole in the back of the chassis. I understand it had to be PCI-2 for bus mastering, but can we not wire the board differently, or at the very least move the VLB down one slot so as not to interfere with PCI-4? Well, this is an Asus board, and their designs are rarely very well thought out, so why break tradition on this one? I'm not altogether impressed. I'll be honest with you, I have prior experience with the Intel 420 chipsets, and like most early Intel chipsets, they're pretty bad. On paper, they look nice, with support for lots of cache and RAM, but they never seem to perform very well and have poor CPU compatibility as well as rather poor RAM compatibility. It's not the worst, and uh, the other board we're going to look at is far worse in this category, but you might have to go through your box of RAM sticks a bit before you'll find ones the board will start with or detect the size of properly. As far as I know, electrically, the size of RAM sticks is just determined by shorting pins out, so... Why some motherboards have a problem with it, I'll never understand. It seems like it should be very straightforward. We can get distracted now, though, and go off on a bit of a tangent. Well, the Intel 420 chipsets have a few notable features going on. The first and oldest is the Intel 420TX. It's a terrible chipset, which is probably what the T stands for from 1992, with PCI 1.0 and support for CPUs with up to 33 MHz bus speeds and pretty much all 5 volts on paper. This chipset is notable because it was used on the Intel Alfredo, an awful motherboard which I don't have and don't want or else it would be here with the ones we're looking at today. This was most likely the first PCI motherboard and best avoided, and probably even more overpriced than these. The 420EX and 420ZX arrived early on in 1994, but what's weird with those is that Intel added 50 MHz support, despite the DX50 having long been swept under the carpet, Intel not offering a CPU that ran on this bus speed anymore, and most of these boards only offering 3 volts, so clearly it's not for the DX50, as... Intel pretty much specify this chipset is only for 3V CPUs. It is at least strongly suggested. They didn't add 40 MHz support officially, as Intel never made a 486 for this bus speed, so which CPU was the 50 MHz clock meant for? I mean, it can't be for like AMDs or Cyrixes. Stranger still is how they added PCI 2.1, which wouldn't appear until over a year later in 1996 on the Pentium chipsets, like the 430VX, the Triton 2. Why Intel would put it on a 486 chipset so much earlier is a little bit of a mystery. But one of the major additions of PCI 2.1 specification was support for 66 MHz bus speeds. We know there were 50 MHz versions of the 420, and that has me wondering now if we've just run into our old friend Socket 6 again. It's rather peculiar that these boards have Socket 3 on them, as the footprint is there for the Pentium Overdrive. Yet you can't use those due to 3 volt only operation. Those CPUs are 5 volt only with onboard voltage regulators. They won't start up on 3 volts. I think what we have here is what would have been essentially a Socket 6 board, but it's Socket 3 that soldered onto it instead. Maybe the Socket 6 spec wasn't done yet, uh, but I still think that was maybe the intention with this chipset, if nothing else. To recap events, in 1994 to 1995, the PCI 2.1 specification was being introduced and has provisions for running at 66 megahertz. In February of 1995, the 63MHz 5V Pentium Overdrive arrives, based on the P54C and fitting socket 2 and 3. In March of 1995, the 120MHz Pentium arrives on socket 5. It's peculiar in that it's the only model designated as P54CQS, and it's a slight revision of the P54C. In September of 1995, the 83MHz version of the P54C overdrive arrives for socket 2 and 3. It's very expensive. 
Socket 6 appears somewhere along the line of these events. I can't really place it. It's a weird thing, as it is 3 volt only, and it has a pin missing in one corner. So the regular 5 volt Pentium overdrives won't even fit, and, well, even if they did, they wouldn't work because of the 3 volt only spec that the socket's supposed to supply. Really, I think we've just found more evidence that my suspicions are correct, and a CPU with a similar footprint was meant to exist for 3 volt operation, and thus not needing the onboard voltage regulators, and likely intended as a cheaper alternative to the socket 5 Pentiums, maybe based on P54CQS. Perhaps it would have been like a Celeron before the Celeron, and the Intel 420 was the chipset that it was meant to use. Maybe this was what Intel designed it for, and why they've introduced the higher clock speed again. Pretty horrible to think of, really. I mean, you'd like to think they'd go up to 66 megahertz, but maybe they'd have been stuck at 50. Uh, don't really know. But yeah, I reckon they would have been socket 6 Pentiums. Now, our second board, the FIC 486 VIP IO2. You know you're in for a good time when the manufacturer's name sounds none too dissimilar to the German word for fuck. Probably to save you exclaiming such in dismay when it doesn't work, and oh boy, does it not work. So the thick boards are wired up. Who wants to bet this is going to phantom beep at us like the fucking Asus? Let's find out. Oh, who would have guessed? Fucking shit. Your instinct to that is the it's like a video beep, so your instinct is, oh, the video card must be loose, and so you'll faff about rattling it down. By the way, Matrox cards are a bit thinner than the others, so they do sit quite loose. But that won't do it, and you'll try all sorts of shit. You watch it boot me. <laughs> nah. Yeah, that won't work. So then you, you sort of get bored, and you try, I don't know. And listen, by the way, what's weird is my splitter box shows that there is a video signal. So you try hitting things a bit. That doesn't usually do it. Maybe it will. You never know. By the way, it looks shit because I'm filming with a phone. But that's what all the cool kids do. And everything's always only cool until Zeph does it. So I'll do it and then it won't be cool and everyone else will stop. So what happens when you film videos on a phone? It looks shit, don't it? If it's all you got, obviously I don't have a problem with it, do it, but... You know, when you're a channel that's out in money, buy a fucking camera, they're not expensive now. So what we'll do, we'll try and lubricate the electrons. There we go. Crazy motherboard fix advice from uh, High Treason here. I'll agitate it a little bit. goes in nice and smooth. So, you know, it's, uh, things dry up when you get old. you got to lubricate them a little bit, you know. I'm not at that point yet, but... Well, we know my taste, so... Oh, dear. Yeah, both of these boards have this problem where they don't really like starting up. I don't really understand what this is about, because really you just kind of keep trying and eventually they'll go and you don't even need to change any settings. They just don't like running. It has one more VLB slot than the Asus, well I guess that's another hundred dollars on the price right there. Minimum. You can wipe that stupid fucking smile off your face at seeing the lack of PCI interrupt jumpers, though, as there's just loads of other annoying ones to set up. It's all disjoint and all over the place and not inherently obvious, and you'll need a manual, most of which are wrong. Resistor packs and all, you're going to be sat there faffing about and making the ends of your fingers sore for quite a long time. Overall, a lot of the same issues exist on this board as with the Asus. RAM compatibility is poor, but to the extreme on this board, and usually you'll get only one stick to work in just one random slot. And I don't know why it does this, but it does, and I think it's even quite well known on these. I hate to think there's that many of them out there. 
This board also supports a high amount of RAM and 1 meg of cache on paper, just like the other one. I can't really vouch for how well this will work. I mean, we know how bad RAM compatibility is already, and I've never tested it with more cache, and I wouldn't waste my ICs in here. The VLB's fake on this one, too. The chip here bridges it to the PCI bus, but I'm really not sure what FIC would do in, as this isn't how VIA says to do it in the datasheet for the chipset. It says to do this if you're building a Pentium system, but on a 486 it's just hook the VLB directly to the slots, it seems. Uh, did they not have enough power left to drive the slots directly like that, maybe? I don't know, but in any case, the implementation's horrible. It sort of doesn't have the slot sharing issue, but sort of does, and really I, I wouldn't recommend using both at the same time. You either use it as a VLB board or a PCI board. Not not both. You'll just run into problems. You ask it, well... I think on both of these boards you're just going to run into problems anyway. I wouldn't bother with them. I mean, things like NICs don't tend to work well in them, and they're very choosy about what video cards you can put in as well. CPU support's better on this board, though, by quite a long way. Kinda. For a start, we do have a way to bypass the external voltage regulator and use 5 volt chips. It does also have a full complement of onboard I.O. Which is nice, now the board's saving you money, you don't need to buy additional peripherals and take up slots with them. Oh, by the way, this board came from Lame Guy after I traded an Octech Hippo 15 for it. So if anything goes wrong here, this is totally your fault now. Or something, I don't know. It's probably my fault, actually. Well, I'm still not seeing anything that justifies the price. There are plenty of other much better motherboards out there that can do the same things, and probably better, so maybe these ones we have here today just perform unusually well or something. <laughs> I mean, I don't think so. I mean, uh, you know... I could tell you all the reasons I don't think they will, but I, I can... It's probably easier to tell you reasons that another board wouldn't. Okay, here we go. We're going to be running the AMD X5. To... Ah. Well, um, we're going to be running the right back AMD DX4. To... Ah, shit, the thick board doesn't really do right back, does it? Well, we're going to be using the right through AMD DX4. The... Ah, shit. We're going to be using this Intel DX4 because the Asus board doesn't support AMD processors properly. With an X5 in it, it won't start. The FIC can't really run them at full speed either. While the FIC can do the right through DX4, the Asus handles like the cache is turned off or the Tarbo is off, so we'll have to use this Intel one in both boards. It is a right through DX4. And gee, I wonder why the Asus might have compatibility problems with AMD processors. Oh, just fuck off, Intel. And by the way, you'll have to put a jumper on the Tarbo header of the Asus, or it'll go very, very slow. To which end, I'll be tweaking the boards to get the best performance I can out of them here, and would sort of stability be damned a little bit. For a video, I'm using a Matrox Mystique. It's not really an appropriate card for systems of this age, but for testing, it's good, as it's a really fast card, and it will ensure any bottleneck is elsewhere on the motherboard. In 3D Bench, the thick board wins at 69.2, versus the Aces scraping only 62.3. Very, very poor. Then PC Player, it's close, 16.7, versus 16.5. In top bench, the Fick wins again, 227 versus 202. Uh, it's not really all that impressive. Speed this is weird. The Fick gets a higher CPU score of 42.20 versus 39.21. They should be identical, so I'm not sure what's going on here, given there's no clear reason for this, but uh, whatever. Terrible motherboards, I guess. Memory bandwidth is faster on the Asus at 58.04 versus 47.27. Both are utterly terrible here, to be quite honest. PCI is also faster on the Asus, about 53 megs per second versus 36. Uh, both more than quick enough, but we did have to fiddle with things a lot to get this kind of speed out of them. L1 cache, though, is faster on the FIC, uh, 66.42 over 59.28. L2 also 37.51 versus 33.9, which is quite pathetic. 
Uh, memory throughput is slow to 24.6 for the Asus, 23.92 for the FIC. Doom is 1944, ticks on the FIC. 2028 on the Asus, neither board can run Quake. I'm really not seeing any major performance here. In fact, I'm not really amazed at all, and in many places it seems to be slower than average. And in fact, by quite a margin when it comes to memory operations. Given this is after actively trying to gain as much speed as possible, it's extremely disappointing. So to get a better sense of scale, let's have a look at the ABIT PB4 that I have. This board's also quite costly now, I think, and in this case it could be due to the unusual chipset or the vast CPU support that it has. This board actually does back up what it says on paper. Almost all CPUs from the original 5V models up to the 586 and Pentium Overdrive are supported and they'll work in here, as does right back cache. This ALI chipset isn't what I'm really familiar with, but I'd like to get familiar with it, and this seems like a good opportunity. I imagine it's going to work much like the UMC AAA and the SIS 497. There's no VLB on this motherboard, so they weren't wasting their time pretending, but there is a pisser slot that takes a riser. It's full of profile cases, and, well, I don't have much use for it here, so, yeah, we're going to be using that. You can use a pisser slot as a regular ISA slot, though, and it's absolutely fine. Jumpers are easier to set up on this motherboard, there's not very many of them. Actually, it's quite a nice experience, it's very straightforward. JP7's the CPU multiplier for anyone looking for that, because I don't think it explicitly says that in the manual, but that's what it is. So we'll give this board a, a quick test before we go back to the cameraman. We'll use the Intel DX4 again, and now the board occupies a middle ground in 3D Bench, but it's faster than the others in PC Player, it's the slowest by her in Top Bench, CPU score is similar in speeds. Memory bandwidth is more in line with what I would expect on a mid 90s 486. It's now in three figures. That's brilliant. PCI speed is about 36 megs per second. It's more than adequate. L1 cache speed is about the same. L2 cache is slightly faster than the others. Memory throughput is actually a far bit better. It's also faster at Doom, coming in at 1903 ticks. Uh, and did I mention I didn't tweak this board for speed? In fact, I pretty much left the defaults on with very minimal changes. Seems with this board that we're not actually hitting a wall, and now the CPU is the limit. We can run the AMD in it. Now, it's doing better in 3D Bench. PC Player actually takes a hit, but I don't really care. Top Bench is faster. CPU scores lower in speed, sys, but I don't really give a fuck about that. It doesn't mean much. Everything else, aside from PCI speed, is faster, and Doom is a whole hundred ticks quicker, and the board still has room to be tweaked to get more speed if I want it, and really this is, as I predicted, fairly in line with the UMC AAA and the SIS 497. I think this ALI chipset's pretty good, to be honest, and I think this motherboard maybe doesn't justify its cost, but if you do end up with one of these, you're not going to feel ripped off so much like you did with the Asus PVI 486 AP whatever, or the FIC VIPIO2. Well, I think that was a, an interesting little bit of research, and hopefully a little bit of consumer advice, and I've just saved you paying over the odds. Realistically, I stick by what I always say. If you can find a PCI UM AAA board, then that's what you should go with. And if you can find a VLB UM498 board, then that's what you should go with. Don't try to do both. Just pick one, PCI or VLB, and get a, a, any old motherboard like that will do the job just fine. There's a fairly common reference design that most of them used. And just as promised at the start, you're back with the boring old twat in front of the camera. Not quite old yet, but it's pretty fun. I was looking at the channel demographics, and my viewers are sort of aged at the same rate I am. So we're on track to be a grumpy old man channel eventually. A few yards to go yet. Uh, in any case, I'm not very impressed by this Asus or this FIC. I'm honestly quite surprised by the amount of performance we got out of the FIC. Uh, it took a lot of work to get it there, though. So I don't recommend either of these boards, especially not at the prices they're at. These to me are like 40 
maybe $50 boards at a push. So I don't know where people get off asking the kind of money they do. Not really many redeeming qualities. I mean, performance-wise, the FIC, uh, especially write-back processors, you have a lot of issues, and they'll perform like a single-clock CPU. It'll, it'll be performing like a DX33. And they're just running at full speed, so I don't know why it does that. It's very, very odd. Uh, I'm not the only person who's observed this on them. It's kind of weird because I feel like that VIA chipset might actually be able to perform quite well. Maybe if they'd implemented it according to the data sheet instead of just wanking around with it, it might have been better. Or maybe it was terrible and they did that to get around design flaws in it. We'll never know. I've never seen other models of board that use them, just the two thick 486 VIPIOs. So uh, there must be one out there, but it's probably also expensive and I wouldn't fucking bother. The Airbit PB4, I think those cost a lot now as well. I, I didn't pay really the sort of money people usually ask for these. The Aces, I think, I got out of a, a landfill lot. But yeah, that Airbit one, that's pretty good. I'm going to throw that in a case. That's going to be a PC. It's going to be an AMD X5 because I don't have one of those running. And I don't have much need for one, but it, it seems a shame to waste such a good board. So I, I am going to put that thing to use. By the way, I'm playing with things, so if you've seen like ICs missing out the boards in filming, obviously they were in there when we were recording, it's just uh, I, I've needed them for other, I'm doing various things at once here, so <laughs> I might have had them on loan to another motherboard during filming, and uh, that's going to be quite a, a significant thing when we see it. The big machine I was going to look at, that is, uh, I've got it to work, well actually it's broke again, but I think the expansion cards fall out, or my cheap batteries might have gone flat. So, yeah, I've got to work on some other parts that might take till February, but it is going, so we will be able to look at it at some point. Now, what sort of motherboards I recommend? There's plenty of generic ones. First things first, fuck off the VIP thing, it never ends well. I mean, I like my Aquarius, that's a VIP board. But it's quite hands-on. You need to know what you're doing to make it really work. Uh, so just pick one that's PCI or VLB, not both. UMC chipsets going to be the best. If you can find yourself any generic old board with a UMC 888 for PCI or the UMC 498 for VLB, you're going to be set. It's going to perform really well. It's probably going to be really easy to work with. It's just going to gain no real hassle. The, the early UMC 888s, the... You have to fiddle with things on the PCI a little bit more, but they're not very common, those ones. Uh, most of them tend to be the later version of the chipset where it's all pretty much automatic. It's just plug in and, and fucking go, and it will go. The SIS 496, 497, a good performer. I think maybe a half faster, but it's a little bit more hands-on. So, you know, a little bit more experience with all the machines if you're going to play with those. Uh, the All the SIS ones for VLB generally all right but asus actually made a board on that and i don't know what they did because it performs terribly it's a sys 471 board it should perform quite well and it just does not it's one of the only boards i've seen that can take this cyrix fpu into pairs of us so yeah uh this one i don't remember how i think it had a riser card in it and it, it was the cheapest way to get the riser card and so i just bought the board stole the SRAMs and <laughs> and fucked it off. Obviously the SRAMs were in when I tested it and the, the performance was shit. I wouldn't bother with it. Uh, not very good. Asus boards, I don't find... I don't know why people like them, because they're, they're just sort of gash, to be honest. Uh, never never impressed by them. They always underperform. They always have compatibility problems and finicky shit. You have to set the memory with jumpers on that one. You know, and that's a mid '90s board, and and you have to set the memory up with jumpers, and it's not a chipset limitation. I've had other four seven one boards in it. Actually, I do have one somewhere, and that's an older board and doesn't have that problem. So, who knows? Idiots. I'm sorry if I sound a bit off in this one, but you know, I have a cold, and unlike a lot of people, where uh, they'll just give up and be like, "Please send me money because I feel ill." Uh, I take the old remedy, which is continue like nothing's wrong, and eventually it'll it'll get the idea and it'll fuck off. So yeah, it, the cold will fuck off, and I, I'm just not entertaining it. Uh, it's pretty much gone at this point. Uh, I'm even happy saying it's gone. I just still have the slight tiredness. I'm not coughing and snotting, feeling shit anymore. 
I still have copies of my book if anyone wants one. Um, but yeah, I think we're. I, I might get this finished in time for Christmas. I might not. So if I do, Merry fucking Christmas. And if I don't, well, then Merry fucking Christmas anyway. Um, you know, that's it's that time of year, so I guess. Well, anyways, um, I think I'm about out of things to say here. I'm sure I forgot to mention that the Intel DX4 actually has 16K of L1 cache on it, apparently. But, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'd actually have to go and check that. So... <laughs> Hmm, uh, we'll look at what the speeds this screen say, I suppose. Maybe it has and we're just not using all of it. That'd be a bit odd. I wouldn't put it past either of those motherboards, to be honest. Really, really wouldn't. Um, just, nah. No, I'm not impressed. Not impressed. Don't, don't know why that price comes from. And the same goes for a lot of shit. Um, people are just crazy. They, they really are. They're absolutely insane. Uh, we're going to try and devalue something next year. I've got to build a part for it, so it'll probably end up being quite late in the year. But I, I am determined I will do it, and if I get it to work, then we'll see a piece of hardware on this channel. That should be really expensive, and I'll, I'll explain to you why it shouldn't be, and why it's, whilst it's said to be rare, and there's thought to only be like maybe five or so of them in the world, it's one of the most common fucking things out there. And just nobody seems to have noticed, probably rather conveniently, so maybe we can ruin some people's little wank fest there. That'll be quite fun. I do quite like upsetting people on the internet. It's really, really entertaining. Maybe, yeah. Well, anyways, uh, I'll leave you to think about that. And I hope you've enjoyed watching this. I thank you very much for watching it. Whether you did or you didn't, it's not going to ruin my day if you didn't. That's not my problem. I'll probably just smirk at you. But, yeah, I'm High Treason. Thanks for watching, and until next time, as always, remember, don't be a screw-up, load DOS 622.